hello everybody and welcome to the second afternoon session of, uh, of this day. My name is Tunjay Gürbüz. I'm from Turkey, Industrial Engineering Department of Galatasaray University. So after uh, having spoken about the raw materials and um, green industry, I guess it's time to speak about the digital revolution, the green IT. So interestingly, when we are using our phones or our mail or we log on to our social network, we are not uh, paying too much attention maybe, but the IT is uh, quite a contributor to world CO2 emissions. So, but however, it is also uh, helping to decrease the uh, green, uh, greenhouse gases through uh, increasing efficiency. So therefore, I would like to raise the following questions. So can we develop green IT? How can we reduce its footprint? And how can we make it become a key factor of the Green Deal? Um, I'm very happy and proud to moderate this session. Thank you, Alexandre. Um, where we have an impressive panel, actually, with diverse uh, profiles. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to present you our first speaker, uh, professor Stefan Mangin, a physicist and professor at the University of uh, Lorraine. Uh, so uh, I would like to have a little bit of recap about why information technologies consume energy. For this, I would like to give the mission to you um, to give us an overview of the physics uh, behind the information technologies, if you will. Thank you. And I think I'm going to stand up still since I have a presentation. But first of all, I would like to thank you very much for the nice introduction. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Alexandre, for uh, uh, organizing uh, this uh, very nice uh, event. Um, and uh, I knew the question before today, so I had the chance to prepare a few slides. And if I could have those three, a few slides. Yeah. So um, indeed, and I can. Okay, I can use this. Okay, so we are talking about uh, information uh, technologies uh, right here. And so th the context is the era of big data. And you have on, uh, uh, well, on your left or on your right, depends, uh, what's happening on the internet for just 60 seconds. And this is totally uh, outdated since it was in 2021. And what you can see is that in less than 60 seconds, uh, the numbers of email that are shared, about 200 million uh, tweets, uh, videos. And so we are sharing a huge amount of data. And this huge amount of data uh, is increasing uh, a lot. And not only this is increasing, but uh, there is a cost. It's not only virtual. There's an energy cost. And you see on, on those tables the evolution of the energy cost as a function of the year. Since we are using data, uh, the, the growth of data is ex uh, moving exponentially, so is the energy uh, used. And you see, uh, so this is energy uh, forecast for, for ICT. And you see, for example, data uh, centers uh, showing you the amount of data that are generated. And what you need to know is that it does cost energy. If you do 50 uh, Google search, it's about the amount of energy to boil one liter of water. So it's quite a lot. Uh, there are projections, projections saying that today uh, we are about 10% of the world electricity that is used for electronics. In uh, 2030, it could be 20%. And there are projections that for in 2040, would be, we would use 100% of the world electricity for um, those uh, electronic devices. So, of course, it's not uh, sustainable. You could think, well, it's going to stop. I mean, we are sharing videos, we are sharing texts, we are sharing emails. I mean, how much are we going to share more? The problem is that it's not going to cost stop because we are moving to uh, Internet of Things. Internet of Things meaning that we are, data are not shared only between phones and computers, but between computers and several different objects, like cars, fridge, uh, uh, you name it, uh, watches, and so on. And it impacts all um, sectors of society. Uh, we're talking about smart city, smart environment, even smart agriculture, and so on. Uh, 
And this inc exponential increase uh, is such that 90% of the data that have been ever created were just produced the last two years. And so uh, this has a huge impact. This has a, an impact on energy. Uh, it also has an impact on material efficiency, what's said already this morning. If you take just a simple uh, phone, 200 grams, you need seven kilo of raw materials. Uh, we've talked about the energy, but also the resources. There's about 70 million tons of electric waste that are produced. And uh, in uh, e electronics, there's only two to 5% of the electronics which are recycled. So there's really question about health, society, environment, eco economy, and basically the word stability. So does this uh, big data, does it have a positive impact? Well, yes, of course, and I think we will be talking about this. If we are talking about uh, smart cities, we can uh, use uh, uh, electronics, computers, uh, artificial intelligence in order to reduce our energy consumption uh, and in different ways. We can look at the, 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 the water, we can look at air, uh, electricity, and so on. So it has some positive impact. Does it always have positive impact? Well. I'm not so sure. And one of the examples is Bitcoins. So the amount of uh, power used for Bitcoins is about as similar to the power used by the Netherlands. So comparable to one country. It sounds crazy to me. OK. So one of the questions that you raised is, OK, once we have said this, uh, first that uh, this is not just in the cloud. It has a real uh, impact on energy, on materials. Once you've said that, well, how can we achieve a sustainable uh, digital world? So to obtain this energy uh, efficiency, it's first there's some energy policy that are behind this. There's some energy uh, sobriety, what we want to do as a society. And also there are what kind of technologies uh, we can use. And being, um, uh, having working at uh, IBM in the Silicon Valley for, for two years on those uh, data storage um, uh, technologies and still doing that here, uh, use it, looking at Spintronic. Uh, well, I've tried to look at what, what kind of technology would be uh, more sustainable. And so the sustainable, uh, if you want to be sustainable in electronics, this not only, for example, it's not only about memories, about data storage. It's also about how you do computing how you transport uh, those data, how you generate those data using uh, sensors. And in all those categories, what has been done uh, by um, big companies, the Silicon Valley, for 30 years was to get uh, something that was faster and cheaper. And that was the only goals, faster and cheaper, basically. And now if we say, well, we want it to be energy uh, uh, efficient, then people are going to, we, we can hope that people are going to work on those technology and find solution. And so uh, I think that if we want to have disruptive approach, the, the key message is that we need excellent international uh, research. And that's one uh, example is that the field that I'm working on is Spintronic. So you all know about electronics. So electronics is basically using uh, electrons with their mass and the charge. And so we can, the, the existence of the electron was known in, uh, in uh, 1897, first transistors uh, 50 years later. Uh, Spintronic is using one more uh, quantum property, which is the spin, uh, discovered in 1924, and the Nobel Prize has been given in 2007. And with this, you can use uh, devices, I, I will try to show you, uh, using uh, less energy and being smaller, so using much less uh, materials. And so, for example, if we take Spintronic, it allows to read uh, uh, a magnet, so basically the information. If a magnet is there with the north pointing up, it's a zero. If the north is pointing down, it's a one. And that's exactly how a hard disk works. And what you also need to do is to manipulate this magnet, manipulate the magnetization, and we are using uh, the spin of the electrons in order to do that. And one of the reasons there's a, a big energy gain is that if you take any memories 
they are volatile because they are basically based on charge, like a battery. And if you leave a battery here and you come back in 10 years, you, there, there'll be uh, no more batteries there. Uh, whereas if you leave a magnet, if it's, the north is pointing in one direction, if you come 10 years later, they still be there. So it's non-volatile, so you don't need energy to keep this information. And so we've been working on, on Spintronic, which I've shown, and now we are working on ultra-fast Spintronic. And the idea is to say, okay, what if instead of having a current passing through to read and write the information, what if we are using light? And light is much faster, and you can also concentrate energy on a very short time. And here we have a pulse that are 30 femtoseconds, and with those 30 femtosecond pulse, we are able to write information, and that's could, what could be shown here. Can you start the, this video uh, here? There should be a video there. Yeah, and so this is one example. Those, this is a magnetic material, so you have two contrasts. Why contrast is magnetization pointing toward you, the, the magnetic moment pointing toward you. Black contrast is in the other direction. No magnetic field, just this uh, laser. And you can reverse, you can write at a very, very short time scales. So we can be uh, at least 100 time, 1,000 times faster. And if we look at the energy, directly uh, used is 100 times less uh, energy. So this is one example, and we're super proud to write IGL, which is the name of our institute. For the first time, it's not IBM uh, written. And with that, I would like to uh, thank you. Uh, let's, yes, thank you. Um, do we have any questions for our speakers? Sorry, at the end? Okay, so uh, we will do that at the end, good. So now I will present you our second speaker to see how the developers actually take this into account. Uh, Sylvain, ah, vous êtes là, pardon, excusez-moi. Okay, um, good afternoon. Yeah, so I, I'm very impressed to be uh, with all those researchers and, and uh, you, um, yeah, universities in the room, I, I'll certainly bring you back a little bit into uh, my world, my real world. Um, so back to the the basics. Um, so I I live in a and I I lead a, a company uh, that that's doing software development. So we do soft, custom software development for, um, uh, for enterprises and, and different organizations. So to, to answer your question, I'd like to uh, maybe um, uh, tell you about our story, our own story, and what I have observed in uh, other organizations um, coming to green IT and eco-design of, of software. So uh, at the beginning of this journey, Frankly, um, nobody cares. It's just not uh, on our radar. It's not an issue. We, as software developers, we just don't think that uh, this is a concern. Um, except for a very specific category of uh, software development, uh, embedded software, IoT, uh, where developers are used to work in uh, constraints uh, well, within within constraints, um, if you if you think about web development, uh, enterprise software, uh, it, it's um, it's more a world where where uh, resources are infinite. I mean, you need another server, just click a button. You need another uh, uh, gigabytes of memory, just click a button. So there is really no no limit. So why bother? Um, and then, then of course, um, we are like general public and citizens, so we, we listen and we see what's in the press as well, and, and then we see these data centers, um, and, and everyone speaks about those data centers and their energy consumption. So. So the, ne the next uh, step in the journey is 
Okay, IT has an impact, and, and Mr. Mangin, you, you made it quite clear, but I can tell you a lot of people don't even know and don't have a clue about what, what you've presented uh, yet. So, um, the, the first, um, the idea or, or the, uh, the, the thought that comes to our mind is it's, it's all about infrastructure. If something has to be done, it's not our uh, job of devel uh, software developers, it's more about infrastructure. Uh, certainly the people who uh, uh, build servers, who build the data centers, they have to something to do about it, but not us. I mean, we're doing something that is immaterial. We are working with the cloud. It's virtual, it's all immaterial. Um, so it's only after maybe some um, awareness raising or uh, some kind of training, uh, like uh, the digital college or uh, collage or fresque du numérique in, in French, or some um, online courses like the one uh, of uh, INRIA or uh, INR. So only after you've been exposed to that kind of content, uh, software developer tend to realize that their code has an impact. Um, so they, they realize that it's not about uh, only coding, it's about the, the full life cycle of uh, the, the, the service that they are uh, creating. Uh, it's about uh, user devices, it's about network, it's about uh, servers, data centers, and that the code that they are creating actually drives the size of all those components. Uh, all too often, it's because we, we don't uh, change our smartphones or our computers because it's broken, but because it's, uh, it's uh, becoming slow. So, um, so it's only when you understand that, that uh, you realize as a developer that what you're doing has an impact on all the other um, aspects in the, in the software um, uh, chain, from user device to, to, to servers. So once you realize that, the question is, maybe if I can get back the slides, <laughs> Yeah, so, so the first uh, thing you, you want to, um, to do when, when you realize that is, okay, how can we extend the lifetime of user devices? That's the first uh, thing we, we can try to do. Second is, how can we also minimize the number of, of servers we use uh, in the back end? And third, how can we reduce the volume of data transferred over the network? when delivering our digital service. And um, yeah, there are not so many guidelines to achieve that. How, how, how to do that? How can we do that? Um, there are some, some guidelines, but mainly for websites, for developing websites. Uh, but very few tools and, and standards are only emerging. So teams, software development teams ask themselves, how, how can I measure? How can I understand what I'm doing? How can I know if this design decision will have an impact and how to quantify that impact? Uh, how do I know if I, I'm doing the right decision? I'm making the right decision. Maybe there are other better ways to, uh, to do the same thing. So one of the First thing, soft, software developers that wor work in uh, web development um, tend to do is go to um, such websites like Echo Index, and you know they type the you can type the URL of uh, your website and get a, a, a result, an analysis of the environmental performance of your web application. So that's first thing they we we tend to do and try to understand where we are today. How do we perform from an environmental point of view? Um, and then, if we want to improve, we need to uh, uh, know how to do that. And, uh, and it's not 
it's not about inventing, reinventing the wheel and, uh, and, and discovering new stuff that are already uh, that have already been discovered by others. So uh, the idea is it really to build upon other um, guidelines, best practices. Um, the, the one in the center uh, for eco design, for, for web eco design, the 115 um, uh, good practices, is one of the most uh, popular in, in web development. It's been created by the, the green IT, uh, fr community. But there are others, of course. Uh, I, I've put uh, some of them uh, here on the slide. Um, and that's, that's really a great help for, for teams who start working on um, green IT and, and, and green uh, software development. Uh, that's a, a very good starting point, let's say. Then, in, 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 um, just like in other fields, the idea is do, how, how can we shift left in the software development lifecycle? How can we shift left the, the evaluation? How can we uh, evaluate not only the final, the final result, the, the, the website that we have created, but how can we make some, some measures, some control, uh, earlier in the process. So there are some tools emerging. I've chosen to uh, to put only one. It's um, because it's made in Nancy, so it's a, it's a good um, opportunity to uh, to advertise this one. It's open source, but it's made by a company based in Nancy, um, with uh, I think the help of some uh, academics also from uh, Nancy. Um, so with these different tools, uh, software development teams start being empowered and, try, uh, and, and start to measure what they are doing, the results, the, the environmental performance of the software they, have, they are developing. Uh, but the next step is certainly to uh, ask um, new questions. Um, I mean, one of the first questions that we, we start asking is, do we really need this? Because, uh, okay, we can, we can do a lot of optimization on how we build it, but how, how are we sure, are you sure, Mr. Customer, that we, we need this in the first place? Is it really needed? Is it really essential? Is it important? Uh, yes, well, this is something else. Um, so, So it, this, this um, question is really about starting a new type of conversation with uh, the, the, sponsor, the sponsors, the product owners or, or customers, and, uh, and trying to bring some more radical uh, design decisions, uh, like, for example, uh, can, we, uh, can we send SMS rather than using smart, a smartphone, which is from a complete life cycle analysis point of view is much more uh, efficient? Or uh, can we uh, implement uh, an email subscription rather than having our users come back to our web user interface again and again? So we create new questions, we, we start new conversations, and it goes as far as questioning the business, questioning the, the business model behind the digital service. Um, I mean, can, can, you, can you rent your, the, the devices? Can you uh, mutualize uh, some of the, the hardware you're using for your, um, your digital service? Well, lots of new questions that come to question the business itself and, and the business model. So to conclude and, and, um, and to try and, and think about how, how, how we can go further and faster um, in, in this uh, area, I'd like to propose three, um, three ideas. First one is uh, about people. We need more people awareness and training. As I just said, a lot of people are not aware about what you uh, explained just before. Um, a lot of software developers are just don't trained 
on eco design. So we still there is still a lot of work to do in this area to make people more aware of the impacts of IT and how to mitigate that and trained on those uh, solutions and, and approaches. Second is there are some communities around there. There are really some great people coming together, forming communities, and I would really urge not only students but also professionals and academics and, and to join those communities and contribute. I, I've put a few of them here, uh, French and international. This is really where we learn from each other. Uh, I find it highly valuable to, uh, to get involved in those communities and learn from the people who, for some of them, have been working on those topics for 15 years. So th there is really a solid knowledge inside those communities. And my third uh, proposal is we need more data. We need more open data, we need more standards, we need more tools, because when it comes to um, uh, work on those uh, kind of challenges, we want to measure, we want to understand the impact of our design decisions, and for that, it's still very, um, uh, let's say, um, basic at the moment. There are some data, uh, there, there is some data out there, there are a few tools, but we certainly need more of them. So uh, I guess also yeah, universities, academics can also contribute a lot in this area. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I would like to move uh, our talk towards more the, to the final product, the AI. So now I will give uh, place to Peter Musilek to talk about the AI and um, to explain how you used artificial intelligence in Canada energy system to provide more efficiency. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, can I please get the slide? So what I decided to do is uh, to prepare a few examples how we can go from the other side. We just heard that uh, AI and data analytics can be quite demanding on the energy which we need to use to train our models, etc. But we can also take advantage of those models and make the power systems or energy systems in general more efficient. So they would uh, eventually use less energy to perform the same tasks. So I'll introduce a few solutions of different sorts which we've developed in, in our research group at the University of Alberta. The first one is related to electric vehicles. Right? We, we heard a lot about electric vehicles today. We are talking about uh, electromobility, about generating the energy, the power needed to, uh, to run electrical vehicles. We talked about batteries, etc. But what about using uh, electric vehicles while they are still with batteries in standard operation for different purposes? So, so this is uh, just an example uh, of a study which we ran looking at how we can possibly replace in commercial buildings or let's say in shopping districts, we, we typically would have diesel generators serving as a backup to provide some resilience or uh, reliability to the buildings. We can consider using electrical vehicles based on different patterns, how they travel, how they would be parked in the buildings, etc., to supply that energy. So there would be some mechanism to have contracts with the owners of the vehicles as they come uh, to their office building or to their shopping building, and they would be willing to let their batteries in their vehicles to use up to some, some portion of the time they are parked uh, to provide a service. So based on, uh, on this study, we can see that uh, depending on what would be the participation, how many of the tenants, let's say people who work in a shopping building or in commercial building, would be willing to let their vehicles to be used this way, we can actually cover during the working hours, during the hours of uh, between, let's say, 8 and 18 in a normal working day, uh, we would have substantial amount of energy. This would be more than we would typically expect to have of, uh, for a diesel generator for a comparable size of building. Uh, 
So this is really just based on analyzing the data, of course, we will use energy, but hopefully this will allow us to be more efficient, to be protective of the environment by avoiding to use, uh, let's say, diesel generator, which, will, uh, which would uh, generate more emissions by using the electric vehicles in the future when we have more penetration. Another example is uh, called uh, federated learning forecasting. So quite often in power systems and in many other systems, we need to do some forecasting. For example, in order to optimize the operation of power grid, we need to know what to expect in terms of consumption load at individual points of consumption, whether they are households or commercial buildings or even industrial establishments. So one way uh, to do that is to use, rather than only the central servers, and we, we've heard about the power consumption, let's say, of data centers, which would have a large, uh, large servers uh, doing all the calculations, we can use uh, endpoint devices, the, the devices on the edge of, uh, of the internet cloud. And uh, in, in the case of power system, those would be, for example, smart meters, right? So devices which would be primarily designed to uh, take care of monitoring the consumption at the endpoints, but it can also be used to perform cell calculations. And there will be uh, some aspects, some advantages and disadvantages. One of the main advantages why this approach uh, has been introduced initially is the protection of the privacy of the end users. So maybe the people or the establishments or companies who are at the endpoints do not want uh, to share the information about a load that widely, and this approach will allow that. So there'll be some communication between the central server and the endpoints, let's say smart meters, implementing this forecasting function to, to perform uh, this operation without necessarily sharing the actual data. So there'll be a mechanism in which the local, let's say smart meter, would be able to provide parameters for a common model without sharing the actual data. And of course, there will be additional uh, additional aspects of this uh, mode of operation. In one of the previous presentations, we've heard that we need to be able to sense the information. So let's say sense the data, monitor the data of actual load consumption. We need to transmit the data. So this transmission will be skipped because we can actually do the training locally on the endpoint, etc. A few other slides are describing uh, an approach how we can increase the capability of the current power distribution grid, which has been uh, developed on last few decades, maybe half a century or more, and was not designed to support the big load of electrical vehicles. If you think about it, the typical Tesla or any other electric vehicle, if it's fast charging mode, it has a load which is comparable or greater than a typical house. So it's really huge a huge increase in the requirements for the power system to operate and to provide energy for the charging. And this can be a problem, and we need to think about how to solve it. Of course, we can replace the conductors, which will bring a lot of uh, issues related to materials, as we heard today. It will also be a huge investment from the perspective of uh, redevelop redeveloping, reconstructing the infrastructure. Most of those uh, distribution circuits are buried, they are underground, and therefore it's not a simple task to replace the conductors supplying uh, power to, let's say, a city. So one approach to extend this or to postpone uh, uh, this necessity is to think about how we can share power between different circuits at the same time. If we have different circuits, and this is in a very simple way uh, shown on that diagram on the left, we can imagine that we may have different residential, commercial, and perhaps even industrial loads in the neighborhood. And therefore, they will have different, uh, different load demand. The curve of when they have maximum, how high that maximum would be, can be different for each of the circuits. And therefore, we can consider sharing this power. This is a simple case when we would have multiple circuits, and again, in our example, we have four circuits which are some of them normally connected and some of them are normally open. They will be supplied from different sources, from different substations. But those normally open points, so those are the empty circles, uh, can be closed. 
their original purpose is to provide the connection in case of contingency. So if there are some issues, if there are some problems, one substation, let's say, is out of order or it's overloaded, the power can be coming from uh, some other neighboring substation. And we can take advantage of this and equip those locations where the open switches are uh, installed with energy storage, and then we can do some equalization of the load. So we did this study based on some actual data from one of the distribution companies in Edmonton. And we considered four real circuits. We considered some traffic patterns with different levels of penetration of electric vehicles ranging between 10 and 60%. And we can see some basic statistics for the four circuits on, in the table on the right. We would then optimize the location and sizes of the energy storage systems. And you can see that those are quite reasonably sized systems. Those would be normally available today. So for example, for a 30% penetration of electric vehicles, 30% in a sense of what is the typical peak load for a given circuit, we would be able to shave that peak. Uh, you can see the outcome of this optimization, again, for the 30% example at the bottom. In the graph on the left, we have the original load. If you would assume 30% penetration of EVs, we can see that the peaks would generally go higher up, and especially the yellow one, which was original highest, would again be substantially higher than the other ones. And by installing uh, the battery energy storage systems at the locations indicated by those yellow squares, we would be able to lower all of them. And we found that we would be able to do that with the existing circuit and reasonably sized uh, energy storage systems up to 8 megawatts. That was our limit, again, based on what's available commercially, up to 50% of EV penetration. So this would allow us to postpone, to defer the upgrade of the distribution circuit. We can go in further and consider more sophisticated solution, which is not routinely available today, but we may have something which is called soft open point, SOP, and it's a smart switch for power, which allows us not only to store energy or to direct it in one or other direction, connecting to circuits, but we can also do some correction to the power. So in this case, for example, power factor of, uh, of the power flowing through the switch. And in our case, again, we used, uh, we can see four circuits. They are distinguished by different colors on the diagram on the right, again, based on the actual topology of circuits uh, in a real system. And we would consider uh, seven different locations, in this case, where we could possibly install those soft open point devices. Because those devices are smarter. They can really do much more than just the mechanical switch on off, connecting or disconnecting to circuits. Uh, we would be able to do much more. And we can see on, uh, on this slide a couple of, couple of results. So the very left graph shows us that without any device, of course, wouldn't help much, right? You wouldn't have anything installed, you wouldn't do any change. Using a single device, those would be the green bars on the diagonal, we would be able to obtain some good solutions. They are expressed in terms of fitness functions, so it doesn't really tell us anything numerically, but we would consider a number, number of, uh, number of uh, characteristics, you can see them listed here, uh, some violations on the circuits, for example, boost voltages. If we have too much charging, then the voltage would dip too much and it may not be acceptable. It may actually cause some issues for your computers and any other appliances or devices in your houses and in our establishments. Line currents and substation power factor. Again, this would be related to power quality and up to a certain level it's acceptable, but below that it may be too much. So that, that's the uh, function which we use for the optimization. And then if we would add second device, we would see those three points which are very low and they are actually highlighted again in the second, second graph, those three green dots which we perfectly solved the problem. We are able to support more uh, penetration of electric vehicles and at the same time we are optimizing the performance of the system, in this case from the perspective of power quality and acceptability of operation of the power system. And then the table shows 
uh, where would be the locations of those soft open point devices? We can see that they are quite consistent, which is good because if we install one and with the increasing penetration of electric vehicles, we can keep adding new locations, new soft open point devices, while uh, not having to replace the original ones. Another example uh, is again related to the topology of the distribution network. And this time we are considering not smarter device, but more options how to connect or disconnect different branches in a network representing the power distribution system. So we can see here, again, a simplified version. In this case, we were using the IEEE uh, test system. So those are uh, systems which are provided for researchers and practitioners to test their ideas. So we, we had different uh, sizes of the systems, and we used uh, also data from 136 bus, which is reasonably size, similar to a distribution system in a typical neighborhood from Brazil. And in this case, we were using AI to train a system deciding how to switch the switches. We had basically unlimited, at the beginning, unlimited number of options, how we can uh, achieve different configuration of the network. Of course, some of them wouldn't be feasible. They may cause, for example, loose, uh, loops or, or short circuits in the system, so those have to be avoided. And then we use different types of reinforcement learning algorithms to optimize the configuration. And this would depend on what is the load at individual locations in the system. Again, this is very relevant, let's say, to electromobility, because if you install a number of charging stations, the situation, depending on how busy the charging station is, would change, and we may have very different situation and different configuration of the topology, how the switches are open or closed within the network can actually provide us with different advantages and disadvantages. So another example, we can just see some curves of learning when we would use machine learning, in this case, reinforcement learning, to train how to proceed with this. And the last example is yet quite different. This is a situation when we would consider a neighborhood when some people would be prosumers, they would have uh, photovoltaic panels, some of them would have battery energy storage systems installed in their, on their houses, and they would be able to trade locally. This is a good example how we can, again, circumvent the limitations of the current uh, power distribution systems which were not designed for this type of operation. In this case, let's say somebody is generating photovoltaic energy on their house, they are selling it back to the grid, and somebody else, perhaps quite far from the original location where it was generated, is going to use it. So this is very inefficient. There is a lot of losses, etc. So using it locally would be, uh, would be much better. Uh, we designed a system uh, for transactive energy exchange when we can actually consider the cases that I will generate some photovoltaic energy in my house, I can sell it to my neighbor, and the neighbor will pay less than uh, if they were buying the energy from the grid, and I can get more from the neighbor compared to what the grid operator would provide me. So we tested the system uh, just based on the economics of basically uh, simulating simple market, and we found that it behaves reasonably. This is illustrated in those couple of graphs on the right. But we are currently developing software agents which would be trading on behalf of the owners and users. Right? So this is something which is a very interesting problem. And it would solve the issue which is quite common in demand management systems overall that people are not willing to. Unless there is a big gain, people are not really willing to, uh, to get on and to participate by determining what uh, what should be the price they are going to sell or buy energy. Right? So those agents would be able to do that. And again, we are trying to come up with good algorithms, which would be good for the system, would be beneficial for the users. So those were just a couple of examples of how we can use AI and how we can use data analytics, which of course are consuming large amounts of energy, but for the benefit of improving the performance of power distribution systems in this case. And of course, although it's demanding, those demands will typically come only at the time when those systems are developed and trained. And once we train them, we can deploy them in the system and use them much more efficiently. So I'll end here with the examples of how we can use AI and data analytics, the green IT, to support operation of the power systems.
Thank you. Thank you very much. So in the last round table, we have seen how investment is crucial to Green Deal. And now I'm inviting you to um, explain us a little bit how IT can promote sustainable economy. Thank you very much. Thank you all representative or colleagues who are there. Actually, when I was planning my, my topic, my research, I was thinking to present you the result of my investigation, but I would like um, to uh, react on Sylvian's to uh, topic because I support uh, the idea that IT also should think about decreasing the pollution, decreasing the using of energy. I am representing my country, Ukraine, who was really um, attacked uh, that year because we, of uh, rocket attacks, we didn't have electric energy. And I need to share with you that uh, due to help of each of your country who support us, who gave us generators, accumulators, second law, we uh, fit with this, but at the same time we realized one more important question. When we talk about IT, it's really important to use cloud storage. I need to, sh to share you, with you my personal experience. When you don't have electricity one or two days and nights, you don't have the possibility to use your notebook, mobile phones, etc. You don't have the possibility to charge them because you don't have the battery. If you have the battery, it doesn't mean that when you receive the electricity for a couple of hours, even if it would be really powerful, you don't have time to upload them. So it doesn't matter how big battery you have if you have a lack of electricity. That's why I need to share our own experience. We try to be effective in a couple of hours. What did we do? First of all, about IT, we go to clouds. I can't imagine a few years ago that university and IT services will be so powerful and so, let's say, good connected to, to each other because we share everything what we can in clouds, first of all. Then we decided that to, how to manage with electricity. You will be really, let's say, smiling, but when you don't have electricity, you are not, let's say, sharing Facebook. You don't use your WhatsApp because you don't have mobile internet. We talk about 5G, 4G, but in Ukraine, in that time, we don't have even 3G. Do you remember H? It was maximum what we had. So it was like lucky that moment I can send at least at, by Viber. Not really quick, but in one hour, probably it goes. So it was like to send in some birds to my friends. But at the same time, we tried to, to use it and we realized how many electricity, how many energy we try just on Facebook photos, when sharing some news, etc. So we try to collect our ideas and to focus on the most important questions, what we need to, to do and what we need to think. So my idea was that for IT, I think we need to focus and to understand that it would be like personal policy, how you use your internet, how many hours you spend for work, for research, and how many hours you spend for entertainment. And uh, continuing to, let's say, my topic, I would like to say hello to the session three, because when you, uh, first session two, I'm sorry, because when you talk about the banks and investors, it was like really deeply connected to me. My idea was to share with you uh, the presentation about this, because uh, just before war, we started to collaborate with banks. Uh, the idea was, how to fix the standards of Green Deal for IT projects and how to implement it in real projects. So, for example, if we talk about informational technologies, we decided to develop and to give the support to the banks who want to develop the scoring model to evaluate, do you remember, loans which could be invested in your project. So how 
how we can evaluate if it is necessary or no. We are answering on the question how to build a scoring model based on different factors, not only financial one, but things about electrical engineering. It doesn't fit from the first side that it really connected to us. As Sylvian thought, IT was not thinking about this. We faced with it when we need to collect, actually in Ukraine, there are a lot of data storage services. And if you don't have electricity, how to manage them? It's not possible in such circumstances to relocate them how we did. So we need to find electric energy. We need to use like solar panels. Some people who didn't know about it try to fix, try to do, try to manage how to, to do, let's say their projects more green because we don't have other choices. So we are on this step and I would like to share our results before the war, but you can compare with it. So first of all, we would like to share our experience and we try to fix the data. The issue is that when the banks ask us to develop such models, they said, you know, there are some standards, uh, there are some big papers, GP Morgan said us about green energy, yes, about scope, but they didn't tell us how exactly to manage it, how evaluate, what are exactly the metrics, how to do it. So we need to develop our own system approach, how to do it. First of all, we collected the data from financial part. We use the exactly data from Fred source, where it was focused on financial institutions who already implemented and used some green projects. Another idea what was if we also for the same companies, for the same projects, add some environmental part. Because we have such information from then. We have information about energy, we have information about GHG emissions, CO2, so we have about pollution also. If we combine and compare, what would be result? So, first of all, we tried to develop the metrics. So, we decided that we will divide all companies in three categories for us. It would be like minimal risk, uh, let's say low risk, it's like B, and moderate risk. And due to these, uh, let's say, metrics, we will evaluate each of company how good they are, how bad they are. First of all, we tried to use like different models and different approach for credit rating. And due to Petrus mentions, we use artificial intelligence as well. We try different metrics and different models for this. So we collected data, we gather them together, we use the same scope you remember about Green Deal, so we try to collect and to find these compatibilities between both data sets. And then we make a joint data set. And based on this joint data set, we try to evaluate separately financial, green, and all-together metrics. And we receive really interesting results. So if we use just financial metrics, you see the slide, we try to build the models, we give us the possibility to evaluate each project. So if your company came to me, I am investor in this moment, and try uh, about the one, I need to evaluate how green your project is. I can evaluate only you as a company, how you good in financial things. But in environmental things, I don't know anything about how green your project will be, how it influences on our country, on our world in future time. So we do the both. And it would be really surprised. We try different metrics and we realize that when we use green metrics and green evaluation of this project, we receive the score which is the most higher for this. We tried different methods. We tried neural networks. We tried random forests. We tried SVM machines. So we tried different metrics and all of them confirm us that it works. So our assumption about that idea that green indicators, green metrics are really influenced on our future projects are working. So that's why when I'm talking about the green IT, I need to admit every time when you try to produce something, try to think about how you can improve the world with your IT and how you can decrease the pollution, emission and energy using. 
In this case, if your answer or no to this question, your IT will be really successful. And by bank's score, you will receive the highest. So your one and your project will be accepted. So I invite all our investors, I invite all our developers, let's work together. At least we have the methodology how to evaluate the projects. And let's make our world more green and, green and more sustainable development. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. So I think that in all of these things that we talk about, human behavior takes a part, takes a role. So, Sebastian, uh, according to you, your experience, how can you incorporate behavioral science and AI into Green Deal? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the idea behind that was to take a step back as we talk a lot about materials, products, uh, sustainability, and everything. And the idea behind that was to explain why behavioral science has a role to play there. So behavioral science, to explain that, is study behaviors and actions, like how we act, why, how we are influenced. And the idea is, in contrast to what we experience in our life, um, we are much less in control of our choices and behaviors than what we think. So <clears throat> behavioral sciences study that. And the idea beyond that, uh, if we can launch the presentation, So behavioral science uh, do not mean ready-made solution, but it means um, <clears throat> scientific method based on empirical data and mostly ethnographic studies. So when I say don't trust your gut, um, the common example is that a lot of products and solutions that should work do not work uh, in the context of real life. And why? One of the reasons, if I take an example in the energy sector, is that a lot of TSOs, DSOs, and energy retailers are trying to raise customer awareness. And they develop their products this way. Like, I will raise customer awareness. I will explain them so well and why it's a good idea and the purpose that they will be convinced and they will choose to use my product. But the fact is, we are not rational. And a good example about that is a study about, eleva about elevators. And the fact is, if you want people to take the stairs, I'm pretty sure the first ideas to come into the table are, OK, let's explain why it's good for the health, why it's good for the environment. But the truth is, that doesn't work. So the solution ac that actually works is to put bricks and barriers. And the, the idea that came into the table was to reduce uh, to increase the um, closing time of the doors to 20 seconds. So you can imagine it's getting weird to be in the elevator for 20 seconds, standing with some guys maybe you don't even know, and just waiting for the doors to close. So from that, people started to take the stairs, and then it became an habit, and the easiest way to go to the fourth or fifth floor, I don't know. This is an explanation and a good example to, to, to show you that we are not rational in our behavior. The second point is assuming visualizations will help users judge if the energy consumption is normal, excessive, or economical. And I will get into that after about data visualization because it's a huge topic in the energy sector and mainly for energy retailers. But you have plenty of way to present that data to people. You can use charts, graphs, etc. But you are still assuming that people will analyze that and will have the knowledge to, to understand. Like, OK, so when you are developing your product, the right idea is to think, OK, do I have to show them kilowatt hour? Do they, will they understand that? Or do I use euros? Maybe it's more tangible for them. Do I use charts and graphs? Or do I, do I use interactive digital screens, etc.? So these are. A lot of questions you have to ask, but at the beginning of your product development. And sharing energy data without context in users' um, everyday life is quite problematic too. And one example to understand why the environment has a huge role in uh, behaviors 
is the late adoption of um, EV, so electric vehicles. So non barriers of late adoption of electric vehicles are cost, range, and charging convenience. So it's easy to explain. Cost, first of all, is because it's quite a new technology, and EV costs a lot, so it's expensive. But this is not the main reason. The main reason is because people now mostly buy their cars in the second-hand market, and you don't have a lot of electric vehicles on the second-hand market. All these are old models, and so not interesting today. Second part is um, the range. And the fact is, a lot of things in our lives are developed to answer the peak demand. Uh, a good example is highways. So you can find highways with four or five tracks, but it's mainly for midsummer time when people are going to holidays. So the question is, people will need to, I don't know, go once or twice a year to holidays, so they will need a vehicle to cross 500 kilometers or 600 kilometers, and they will find and want to find a vehicle to answer this. So I want a vehicle to be able to go to holidays when I have to. And so this is a problem for adoption of EV, even if they don't need this range in their everyday lives. And the third is charging convenience, and this is why uh, environment is really important, because uh, the example is uh, the UK. So in the UK, you have 60,000 charging points, and in contrast, you have only 9,000 uh, gas stations. So, but the problem is when you ask people, none of them are able to say where are the, more, the closest charging points, of, or if there are any, anyone, any of them close to, to their house. house. And the fact is, charging ports are mainly installed, installed um, at the place most convenient for the installer more than the user. So environment is important because when you are talking about range or everything, people will say, okay, I have huge confidence into gas vehicle because I'm pretty sure I have a gas station like 10 kilometers away because I see this huge gas station, but they don't, they don't trust EV because they are not able to see because charging points are, are easy to overlook. So this is why you have to start with human and not data. And this is a personal example, because we talked a few months ago with an innovation poll of one of the largest energy retailers. And we were quite surprised because the first questions to come were, OK, how do I make people want to buy my product? How do I get them to use it? And this was regarding a new product with a lot of features. So it means they spent months and spent a lot of money to develop a product. And the question at the end were, OK, how do I make people want to buy my product? And we were like, OK, let's start from the beginning. Why are you developing this product? And what are the desired behaviors you want to, to tackle? So you can't engineer the human out of the problem. Another fact is cognitive overload. <clears throat> and you need to save our mental energy. And if you want uh, an order of magnitude, we are exposed to as much information a day today as a year in the 19th, 19th century. And it brings a complex information processing based on intuition. And one explanation of that, uh, developed by Kahneman, is system one and system two. So system one is intuitive habits, hunch fast. This is what we use in our everyday lives because we are exposed to so many information that we have to use this intuitive and habits, etc., because we will not be able to like rationally and thoughtfully think about each problems of our life deeply. So we use the system one. But the problem is when we develop problem when we develop products and digital solutions, these are mainly developed by R and D teams. So they are in their offices drinking coffee and mainly using their system two. And they are assuming that people that will use their products will be on the same state of mind, meaning a system two, rational, systemic, thoughtful, and this is not the case, as you know. But let's get back to some use cases. So in the energy sector regarding digitalization, there are three main categories of use cases. Uh, these are the current use cases discussing in all, um, all the meetings. So three main categories, engagement, empowerment, and collaboration. The centerpiece of, of that are the customers and mainly the data visualization regarding disaggregation, solar, EV, 
um, each time you are facing data visualization. And you have plenty of way to, to visualize the data. You can have charts, you can have, as I told you, uh, bars, and etc. As humans, we have a lot of biases, so cognitive biases. And this is the main explanation of why there is a gap between intention and action. So for example, if I tackle just the energy sector, there are three main biases that are interesting to understand. There is the inertia bia, and it refers to our inability to perceive the benefits of a change. The present time bias, it means our tendency to focus on the present more than the future. And it's quite a problem when you are in the energy sector, as in the present, it's mainly cost, like you have to, to put money on the table, and the future are benefits. But as we are biased with our present time bias, it's really hard to engage people this way. And the last is overconfidence bias, and it's our tendency to, to have a deep faith in our human capacity to overcome problems. And uh, this is also a problem, like huge, huge, huge faith. So I chose uh, four examples to, to present to you some nudges that we can use in behavioral science. The first one is about, about O power and they are using social norms. So basically, when you are going to your, I don't know, EDF or total app, now it's quite, uh, it's quite uh, normal to find like social norm or peer comparison. But they were the first one to introduce that. And the reason is our brain is wired to do what the ma majority does. And as I point with the red, red arrow, nobody wants to be here like less than the normal, okay, I'm less efficient than my neighbor, okay, I will change my behavior. So this is a huge tool to help people to act and make the, the right behavior, as well as the feedback, feedback looks, loops, like to say it's good, great, it gives like feedback to people. And it's quite interesting because <clears throat> as human, if you take an example in the prehistory, like just think about, I don't know, fruit, fruit pickers, like, this is imitating others is the most efficient way to learn. Like, just think about a fruit picker observing another one, just grabbing some fruits, eating them, and the day after is still alive. So, okay, it means these are good fruits, so I can pick them, uh, grab them, and feed my family with them, and I will survive. So, imitating others from, from the past uh, is always the most efficient way to learn. Another nudge which is quite interesting is Anfiro which is a company, and the idea behind that, and I'm pretty sure you, some of you are staying in hotels in Nancy, and in every hotel now, you are able to find a paper saying like, okay, we have to reduce our water consumption, and they are explaining you, explaining to you, like why you have to do that, okay, how many liters of water you are, uh, the, the hotel, um, the consumption of water of the hotel, but the fact is people are not reducing their consumption. So Hanfiro, Hanfiro came with an idea, is to, put a digital screen, and the fact is, for example, in the Germany, people stay between 8 to 12 minutes under the shower. It means 150 liters of water, which is quite a lot of water. But there is an explanation in terms of behavior. It's because nowadays, the shower is quite the only place of meditation in our life. So you lose the perception of time. So the idea of Anfio was to put a little digital screen with just a timer, and they add something, but this is not shaming, okay, you don't need to shame people, but they just put like a polar beer on, on ice, and as long as you stay in the shower, you will see the ice is melting, and then the polar beer is drowning. And I'm pretty sure if you are a normal human being, you will catch your shower before the polar beer is drowning, or maybe not, <laughs> but then you have to ask you some questions. <laughs> so it's quite effective. Another one which is quite interesting uh, is Mimica. And the fact, so I was quite impre impressed by the number, but up to 83% of food waste in Europe is still fresh, fresh and edible. So it brings a lot of cost for customers, but also for, for big companies. And the idea of Mimica was to make the abstract more concrete, to have the true longe longevity of food. And to do that, the put it directly on the, on the container, and as you, can, as you can read, it's fresh until bumpy. So okay, it's quite easy. Now 
you don't have to just look, smell, and test. And if you have a doubt, okay, I will throw it because I don't want to be sick. Now you just have to, to test your cap. And if it's fresh, it's okay. And if it's bumpy, then okay, it's not, uh, I can't drink that anymore or eat that anymore. So this is the end of my presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. That will, be all, that will be all the time? Okay. So uh, let's take some questions for our speakers from the audience. No question? I can ask some, if, <laughs> if I may. No, you have? Oh, thank you. Sir. I wanted to ask something. Just one comment at the very beginning. Choose another animal. Polar bears can swim <laughs> for long hours. <laughs> um, well, uh, my question is regarding the tracking of the um, energy consumption in the households. Um, not only showing how much energy was uh, consumed, but can it also show which appliances exactly for how long we're running and how much energy they, they consumed maybe will help to uh, to tell people like um, your fridge is uh, consuming too, too much energy or you cooked for too long this month like to to bring these numbers and these units close to them what are your thoughts on on that one uh there is a huge question about uh, goals you are looking to answer. And for example, about uh, households, you either you want to reduce domestic uh, energy consumption or you want to, to shift uh, energy use away from periods of peak demand. And these, it doesn't lead to the same pedagogy. So if you want to reduce domestic energy consumption, then you can, yes, you uh, use some nudge and you have to put them on the environment. And for example, if you want people to recycle, then the more effective way to do that is to put recycled bins in each piece that creates waste. So it really means you have to, <coughs> to put solutions in the environment. But if you want to shift, uh, to, if you aim load, sh load shift shifting, the problem is that you will have side effects and this is something you really have to take into account because load shifting means people will shift their consumption to another period. But the fact is they not only shift their consumption, but they increase their consumption after. It means that if people aim to load shifting, you are pretty sure that the total domestic energy consumption will ri raise because of this idea of filling the gap when you feel a need. Then as I shift my consumption, then okay, I'm able to, to consume a lot now. May I add, uh, due to our experience, uh, from 23 to 5 o'clock, I tell you, it is more um, effective time to use electro energy. It's definitely right there, but due to the situation, uh, let's say we have like, um, uh, small uh, four hours uh, schedule for each region and if you try to use more electrical devices at the same time it means that your house could be collapsed at even in that guaranteed time of electro energy so for us it was like uh, we tried to teach uh, our children, our neighbors also, not to use all electric energy at the same time, to switch to the lowest side, of course, and try to, let's say, manage not all things to do at the same time, not to charge all your battery at the same time, use fast mobile charging, it's, it also works, it's half an hour, it's not one hour and 30. And also it gives us the possibility, you know, you have electrical bills, you can compare. If you have electricity and know and how you use it during your, let's say, sessions. And we need to admit that this gives us the possibility also to decrease, to decrease electro engineering. So even if it compared to the period before, we have like stable electric connection right now, we return to this mode, it's okay for us and we decrease. So it's like policy for each 
person, I think. It's like your own opinion. Thank you. Yeah, so I need to make a small comment for one of the speakers because basically he has a meeting with the mayor right now. So everything you said will be reported directly to him. So I want him to feel comfortable because if one of our speakers has to run, just that you, you don't think uh, nothing to do. So Stefan, feel free. Uh, if you have to go that, uh, don't, 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 don't be. Uh, <laughs> see. My question now is, uh, you spoke from different perspectives, from the physics, from the programming point of view, also from the behavioral science. And some of you, I think it was Sylvain, you spoke about the, uh, the training. And uh, what would you tell us, what would you recommend us as educators to do um, to train our students so that they will be real actors? What, what, do, what does something need to change? And if yes, uh, what? Maybe I start with you, Sylvain, but maybe the other speakers have a point of view uh, to share on that. Um, yeah, I would say two two uh, elements are, are really complementary because it's not it's not enough to um, raise awareness and to uh, try and, and ex uh, explain the impacts and all the environmental effects and where they come from. Uh, people need to know how to act after that because if you just raise awareness and give no action, people can take. Uh, you're just uh, depressing them, <laughs> or they, they they just tend to uh, put this aside and say, "Okay, I can I cannot do anything about it, so let don't bother anyway." So, yeah, I would advise to maybe first raise awareness, make make the the issues visible, and then empower people so that they can act at their level. Maybe I could have a follow-up question for that, uh, from me, actually. Um, I, you talked about the extension of lifetime of user devices. And, okay, we will educate people, train people and everything. And even we, if we give them the actions, uh, what is your take on the corporation side of the things? What would you say? For, for instance, we know things about like um, planned obsolescence, and everything, so even if we train people, there is this big, huge cog of the system, which is the corporation. Yeah, th there is a big difference between uh, what you're doing at home <laughs> yeah. and, and what's happening uh, in, in companies, because companies have a close look at their, their budgets, their finance, so this is typically the, the first uh, reason why they would uh, change something yeah. because okay uh, we we can um, if they understand the reasoning behind extending lifetime of uh, used devices and rather than uh, renewing all the laptops and and, and 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 desktops every three years because it's the normal uh, uh, it, it's not a, a physical lifetime it's a accounting um, lifetime so uh, they, they can easily understand the, the financial games that they can make uh, very easily. So that's also uh, a positive um, uh, motivation or, or, or um, a facilitation that very often financial uh, motivations and environmental motivations uh, come together. So there, there is yeah, co-benefits or uh, joint benefits of, on a financial side and, and environmental side. Thank you. Other questions from the audience? Yes. Hi. Um, so there's a lot of talk about a lot of different systems monitoring different parts or changing between different parts of the grid watching how power is consumed in the household, how it's consumed in a neighborhood, making the system to switch between these things. How do we put all these systems in place which innately consume power um, on top of the old existing systems? Would it be better to upgrade entirely and have monitoring inside, or should we be slowly and gradually implementing these things?
So I would say it, it really depends from case to case. Uh, you know, there will be different advantages and disadvantages, and it would depend what is the current situation on the grid, what is the topology, how powerful it is. Many systems will have uh, the reserve exist in existence. Some of them will have to be upgraded right away. Um, so I, it's a really difficult, difficult question to answer. Uh, just from the top of the head, we would have to look at the systems and do some analysis and see what will be more expensive. Uh, what uh, will be more beneficial for the system and have some outlook also to the future, uh, what's to be expected. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I can just add some, uh, some information about uh, smart meter ro rollout because it's a good example. I think because you have Europe and you can think, okay, there are regulations, so smart meter rollout will go fine and then everybody will be able to like monitor their consumption. But the fact is, if you take the France, we have quite a monopoly about that. We have one TSO, RTE, we have one DSO, Enedis, and then it's quite easy to implement uh, smart meters and to allow people and, and companies to monitor their consumption and then to, to tackle the energy efficiency. But if you take Germany, they have 900 DSOs and quite more of energy retailers and this is so fragmented that it's quite impossible to, to perform a smart meter rollout and to have standards about that. And if you talk about efficiency, energy efficiency, I think um, to develop standards and to really act on regulations to allow countries to have standards will be a nice, uh, nice idea. Well, thank you very much, first of all, our uh, speakers for their enlightening uh, speeches. And thank you all for um, coming here, attending this session. Have a nice afternoon.